Okay. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming out on this blisteringly cold day. I think the wind chill is, what is it, like, like zero or like minus one or something? It's pretty dreadful. Although I hear it's much worse in other parts of the Commonwealth, so um, hard to think of Philadelphia as balmy, but apparently that's the case today. Um, I want to uh, take a minute to welcome our, uh, our speaker, Brian Landry. Uh, Brian has a very distinguished career in intellectual property. He's worked for a, a bunch of non-trivial law firms and a bunch of places that he'll tell you more about. When we were first talking about bringing Brian uh, in to speak, um, it's in part because uh, he will be doing a lot of the work of the innovation pillar going forward. And we thought it was a great way for him to get to know us and for us to get to know him. And then he came up with this fabulous title. Usually I suggest a title. I think I suggested something. It wasn't nearly as good as this. Yeah, I can protect that. So without, uh, without further ado, Brian Landry. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> so, and, uh, sorry, uh, so, uh, thank you all for coming out uh, again on this very cold day. Yes. Oh, okay. Ah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, again, uh, thank you all. So, uh, when uh, Heather and Donna asked me to speak, uh, they asked me to talk about thinking beyond utility patents, which of course is what most people think of when they think of intellectual property protection. So walk through a couple different areas uh, th that where, where I think IP is often overlooked uh, just because there's a lack of information or recognition by inventors uh, or even sometimes by attorneys. So uh, we'll start with utility patents, which again is the area I think probably most people are familiar with. Uh, spend a fair amount of time on design patents as well as copyrights and trademarks. So one overarching principle here is uh, as inventors, as uh, people uh, having a stake in inventions, whether you're at a company uh, or, or some other organization, there's really a lot of value in thinking about what it is you're trying to protect. Uh, there's quite a few times that we have uh, companies come to us or inventors come to us and they have a product uh, but they don't really have a great idea about what they're trying to protect. And we can certainly work with you on trying to identify what it is that you may protect uh, but th that can be challenging or, or, or problematic in a few ways. One, uh, it's not a particularly efficient way to work. Uh, my, my first project years ago uh, involved me coming in and getting, I think, probably a stack of 100 emails in which the chief technology officer of our client had CC'd uh, my, the partner I was working for every time he thought he might have had a patentable idea. Uh, it was a great experience for me, but again, not probably the most efficient bill. Uh, the other issue is beyond just how much money it may cost is there's a good chance that uh, we may overlook something that you think is important. Now, as we go through and work with you, we try to tease that out, uh, but it, it's always, you know, we'll get there a lot faster if you have some ideas. And, and a good heuristic that we often use are, you know, what is the type of thing that you would take action if somebody was copying? Uh, we use this conversation with our clients often in the trademark space, for example. Uh, trademarks like patents or any other type of IP tends to be territorial in nature. So if we have, we file a U.S. trademark registration, that's in protecting the United States. Uh, we might file in the U.S., Canada, and Europe. Uh, we very rarely, although sometimes we do, file in North Korea. Uh, for most of my clients, uh, you know, we'll point out that we're not going to have protection in North Korea, and I think we'll all sleep fine with that. Uh, but when you get to the question of do we file in China, do we file in Japan, a really good way to think about this is if you knew somebody was infringing your trademark in Japan, would you actually think it's worth enough to spend a couple thousand dollars to try to do something about that? If the answer is yes, then let's file in Japan. If the answer is no, then that's probably not a great use of your funds because uh, it's not something you're willing to back up when it actually gets to that point. 
So uh, starting off with utility patents, this is, uh, a, this is the claim from one of Bayer's patents uh, going back uh, probably almost a century now for aspirin. Uh, utility patents are fairly uncontroversial. They work very well in the chemistry space uh, where the 20 year term plus you know, sometimes uh, some adjustments tends to map pretty well onto their market. Uh, it's a bit more controversial when we apply these to software although software certainly is patentable. Uh, we, we often find ourselves de, uh, uh, correcting some misinformation regarding whether software is patentable. And al although this is a little bit uh, convoluted, I, I think it's helpful just because a lot of people come in at one point along this path and we have to kind of get them to the very end. So as a starting point, uh, we can't write a claim directed to software per se. That's not patentable in the United States under our Patent Act. However, we can uh, file claims directed to computer implemented software. So basically, as long as it's on a disk, that's patentable subject matter. Uh, however, there are exceptions. Uh, we can't have claims directed to judicial exceptions, uh, which include laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas. But the USPTO will allow claims that touch upon those, uh, on those judicial exceptions so long as there's a practical application. Uh, so again, these abstract ideas include mathematical concepts, uh, certain ways of organizing human behavior, as well as purely mental processes. Uh, often a qu question we're getting in the last couple of weeks, uh, after the USPTO released some guidance at the beginning of January is what's a practical application. Uh, this is still a month, uh, a test that's not even a month old at this point, but there's two, ex two uh, considerations that we think are going to be particularly helpful for the clients we work with, like uh, TJU. Uh, one is if you have an improvement to the functioning of computers or other technology, and the second is if you're treating uh, or preventing a, a illness. So these guidelines, like I said, are only a couple weeks old right now. Uh, you know, we don't have a lot of anecdotal information in terms of how this is working, although actually at, at this point I've had a case where a couple weeks ago an examiner was telling us he, he didn't think this would be allowable but mentioned these guidelines were coming out and uh, it looks like these may have done the trick. I'd like to think our arguments were also a part of that, uh, but we'll take it either way. Uh, but it, you know, it's certainly encouraging, although this is not binding on the courts, so there have been some discussions that you know, we could end up with patents that the USPTO believes are fine, but uh, the courts may still have a more rigid view. So at, at this point, Really, the best heuristic that we can offer is to really think about what the technical nature of the invention is, uh, not just the application of technology to a particular field, but really getting under the hood in terms of why this was a challenge. Was there something that you had to work to overcome in actually making this work? Uh, the more technical details uh, that we can put in a patent application, the better the chance that we have of having a patent grant and having that patent be enforceable and valid in the United States. Uh, and the same thing goes for Europe, which has a, a relatively similar test. Uh, even w in view of all this, we often do uh, have a fair amount of back and forth with our clients about whether we file a patent application at all. And uh, you know, even with the uncertainty, we still do and have been filing applications uh, even in the last five years, which have been a bit uncertain. Uh, there certainly can be value in doing that for a number of reasons. One, uh, you know, just simply having that possibility may provide value to the company, uh, may provide value to investors, uh, and, and it may be something that at least makes your competitor stop and consider whether or not they need to uh, consider that patent application or whether they can just go into the field. Uh, and then for a lot of our clients, uh, we end up filing applications just because there's really not a good way to protect it otherwise. With software, oftentimes, 
we do have trade secret protection and we can, we can keep the secret sauce hidden. Uh, however, for other clients that we work with in the mechanical space, for example, th there's really nothing that would prevent anybody from taking their product apart. And in that sort of situation, you might as well file the patent application because once you launch, everybody's going to know how to do this. Uh, and there's really nothing you can do to protect them at that point. So uh, within the utility uh, patent space, one area that's often overlooked is whether the user interface itself might be protectable. And the short answer is it sometimes can be. Uh, we don't see this that often, but this case here that I mentioned, trading technologies involved a user interface for stock trading and uh, it had a particular configuration. Uh, it's not that easy to summarize, but basically, I mean, a lot, given the uh, issue of speed within stock trading, there was a lot of value here, and the court found that to be patentable. So what we spend most of my time on today is design rights. Uh, I, I say design rights, uh, although in the United States they're design patents, that's somewhat of an anomaly in the world. In most other countries, they're considered more similar to trademarks. Uh, and design rights have, again, I think are often misunderstood. Uh, I, was I was talking with a faculty member here earlier who had heard, and accurately so, that design rights can have a limited scope. And that's certainly the case. However, the, uh, the analogy that I use uh, in talking to their clients is that they're similar to a magnifying glass on a sunny day. If an ant's going to be brazen enough to stand underneath that beam, uh, it can really be quite potent. But if the ant's going to walk away, uh, you know, it has a very tight focus. That said, uh, for many products, it's really the only thing that's going to protect a particular, the particular ornamental aspect of it. So uh, again, design rights protect the ornamental aspects, not the utilitarian functions of the product. Uh, it, although certainly there can be both. Uh, I've worked, for example, in the uh, consumer goods space and we would often have many utility patents as well as um, several design patents on the same pro commercial product. It, and certainly you know, the, the greatest example we have is you know, probably everybody's pocket. A smartphone, whether it's uh, iPhone or, or Samsung, Android. Uh, you know, there's certainly utility patents here. Uh, there's design patents on the overall shape. Obviously, there's copyright in the code. There's, trade, there's tremendous trade secrets, uh, as well as, of course, there's trade dress and trade marks on this. Uh, it can also protect uh, graphical user interfaces, icons, and fonts. So uh, these are just some examples of what can be protected by design rights. Uh, everything from vacuums, golf clubs, plane fasteners, uh, automotive parts are very heavily protected by design rights. And there's some ongoing litigation in terms of whether, the right, whether there is a right to repair and, and whether third party manufacturers can produce replicas of, for example, parts of a Ford F-150 for repair without having to uh, pay royalties on Ford's designs. Uh, getting closer to the scientific field, uh, here we have a spinal fusion implant from Nuvasiv, electrophoresis tank from Life Technologies. Uh, consumer goods, uh, clothing, uh, th this is an area where I think design patents uh, are perhaps a little bit underappreciated, uh, but Lululemon recently has had success in obtaining design rights. Uh, jewelry, again, we, of, we often think of this in the terms of, terms of copyright, uh, but you can also protect it with design patents, uh, which can provide some additional benefits. And then user interfaces. Uh, on the left here is the UI, uh, design patent directed to the UI for Uber. Uh, as well as the, on the right, the lock screen for Apple. Uh, you can also get pretty creative, and we're seeing a lot of really interesting, uh, interesting strategies. Uh, Apple is certainly at the lead here. Uh, here, th this is one, uh, one figure from a design patent directed to 
the animation that happens when you select an icon from, uh, from the bottom tray. Uh, sticking with that theme, if you look on the right here, uh, this is a series uh, showing the animation for a file being downloaded. Uh, and on the left, uh, showing battery usage. A few more. Uh, uh, this one over here, the 305 patent on the left, uh, was part of uh, Apple's suit against Samsung, which they won. Now on the right, uh, this is an interesting design patent from Microsoft directed to the Windows Phone. Uh, but again, show, showing the different levels of abstraction, whereas instead of icons, which Apple has, if here it's this grid-like uh, display, uh, which they were successful getting through. And it, of course, is a distinguishing feature of a Windows phone relative to Apple or Samsung. Uh, like I said, icons, uh, an example on the left, as well as fonts can be protected as well. So the reason that design rights can be really quite valuable is that oftentimes they're the only form of IP that can protect against a direct knockoff. So uh, if party A comes up with, launches a product, and product if party B, sometimes they even just copy the mold uh, down to the point where you can see the lettering and it's really obvious, uh, copies the product, there may not be that much that party A can do. So copyright uh, may be barred, uh, certainly, unless uh, artistic work, copyright's likely going to be barred by what's called the useful article doctrine. And what that stands for is that uh, you, you can't use copyright, which has a very long term on the order of a century, to, to protect against copies of physical products. So if you have a lamp, you can't protect that with copyright. Now if that lamp includes a portrait uh, that's printed on it, the portrait may be uh, copyrightable, but not the lamp itself. Uh, trademark trade dress is only available if you show acquired distinctiveness. Uh, that's a very expensive proposition. Uh, you, you, we certainly can, you could envision seeing that with the Coca-Cola bottle, for example, where it's so well known that people see that, they think it's from a similar source and it's from Coca-Cola. Uh, we've also seen successful claims with the uh, Walter PPK uh, handgun, uh, which was used by James Bond in the 007 series. But even, even in that case, looking, it, it was a difficult uh, win for Walter to obtain and probably cost them at least $50,000. So for most of our clients, most startups, that's just really not an option. Uh, so design protection provides, a, a, provides that type of protection. Uh, but at a you know, several orders of magnitude cost difference. So this is an example here with regard to something that, this is a bike rack. Uh, again, company had not filed design rights on it and then set, instead tried to uh, sue someone for copyright infringement. The court found that this was barred by the useful article doctrine. So this only works, however, if Party A had thought about design rights at the get-go. Uh, in the United States and in other countries, uh, it's, it's, you're subject to time bars in a way that you aren't with trademark protection. So you really need to have thought of this before you launched your product. In the United States, you have a one-year grace period. In the rest of the world, most countries are what we call absolute novelty regimes. So if you launch your product on Monday, uh, you've, lost, you've lost your European rights if you haven't filed by Tuesday, or by, by Monday. Uh, so uh, again, it's really one of those things where you do want to be thinking about this and uh, unlike in the utility field, you actually probably even need to give your patent attorney a little bit more time uh, because although we can work pretty quickly uh, to try to put together the utility uh, uh, provisional application, that's rather informal. We don't have that ability with design rights. So as I mentioned, design rights can be rather strong, uh, allows for complete disgorgement of a competitor's product. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, this 305 design patent was one of several asserted by Apple against Samsung. Uh, wasn't the sole factor in a over $1 billion uh, 
damages award, but uh, you know, still uh, obviously a, a key part of that, and even though the award was reduced to half a billion dollars, that's still quite a lot of money. So as I mentioned, there are some pitfalls to be aware of. Uh, one, uh, we cannot claim priority to provisional applications. This is something that even patent, many patent attorneys overlook. Uh, you, again, you almost always need a drafts, uh, drafts person. If you, you know, any of these drawings that you see, they look really quite different than what most people bring to us. Uh, so we need to work with a drafts person, although we have people that can work pretty quickly. Uh, it, it does take a fair amount of work and it's not the type of thing where we can easily file something that day if somebody comes to us and they're launching tomorrow. Uh, and then foreign filing uh, tends to be more complicated than in utility patents. Uh, we, we don't have, although there is an international filing mechanism, uh, it's not anywhere near as ubiquitous as the uh, Patent Cooperation Treaty, as some of you may be aware of. Uh, so we tend to do direct filings, and the, the practices in different countries tend to vary rather, wi rather widely. So ideally, we like to give our foreign associates time to make changes and provide recommendations, uh, and, and the real, the mo more sophisticated filers actually uh, will, will take into account what those drawings are going to need to look like down the road. So they'll file uh, their initial U.S. filing with uh, some additional drawings that they know they're going to need for Europe or China, uh, trying to anticipate those road bumps down the road and secure a priority date up front. So uh, given that we're here at a university, I uh, took a look this week to see uh, whether universities are taking advantage of design rights. Uh, and the short answer is yes, but nowhere near as much as utility models or, or as utility patents. Uh, there are about 20 granted U.S. design applications to colleges and universities in the U.S. last year, uh, about the same amount to Chinese universities. Uh, these are just some examples showing uh, different things that are protected. We have a cryovile set from the University of Alaska Fairbanks on the left. Uh, this is a graphical, uh, graphical user interface. And keep in mind here, this is really covering the solid lines. Uh, so these different shapes here, I'm guessing that must be some sort of a ballot box. Uh, here's a, a, a lighting fixture from Indiana. Uh, a six-sided die from the University of South Florida, a vest for intravenous tubes, an aliquot tray, uh, an aerial vehicle, and then a therapy device. And so an another way that we sometimes will protect inventions uh, is with copyright. Uh, copyright, unlike design protection, uh, does not uh, does not bar the creation of otherwise identical software. So if two people independently came up with the same idea or the same expression, that would not be copyright infringement. However, if, if party A comes up with that and then party B has access and produces substantially similar code or, or user interface, that would be copyright infringement. And then that still, is still pretty powerful, uh, although theoretically, uh, independent invention is a possibility. It, it's not something we see that often. Uh, it has a long life, at least 25 years, and usually in the order of a century, uh, so, you know, depending on how long the author lives uh, and when it's published. It gets a little bit complicated, but the short answer is, I mean, unless it's a Disney work, usually uh, the term is far beyond what the commercial value of the work is. So there's fewer formalities with copyright than with designs or uh, utility patents. Uh, copyright exists once it's fixed in a tangible media. So uh, anybody who's taking notes right now, there's copy, you, you own a copyright. Uh, can be registered at any time and there's minimal examination. However, because of this, what we often see is that copyright uh, tends to be rather rather forgotten until you absolutely need it. 
And there's some disadvantages to doing that. Uh, the major advantage, so th there are some significant advantages to registration. Registration first is required in order to bring suit, uh, but more importantly, registration entitles the registrant to statutory damages of up to $75,000 per act of infringement. And, and that can be a, a pretty powerful cudgel uh, to include in a warning letter to somebody that's infringing the copyright. Uh, but you can only get that after it's registered. So if it's a situation where somebody comes to us and they believe somebody's infringing their copyright, it takes, you know, it takes you know, at least a month to get it registered. Uh, you know, it's a much different, the economics can change really quite substantially, uh, you know, from having that registration to uh, and being able to claim back damages as opposed to obtaining the registration and asking them to stop. So uh, we do uh, sometimes get calls uh, regarding trademarks coming out of universities. Uh, and the short answer is for university work, it's rather difficult to protect trademarks. Now, Thomas Jefferson University or, or things that are fully university activities, those are easy. Uh, but if we have a startup where somebody came up with a particular name, those, uh, it, it can be rather problematic to have TJU file for that trademark and then try to transfer it or license it to the startup. And, that, and that's for several reasons. One, U.S. law doesn't allow uh, or puts restrictions on assignments of trademark applications that are based on intent to use. And the whole idea there is to prevent registration and trafficking of trademarks. Uh, the second issue is that if TJU or another university were to hold on to those rights, uh, whoever owns the trademark needs to be responsible for quality control. So for university, you typically don't want to be in a position where uh, you're responsible for the activities of a startup that you don't have that much control over. Uh, so off, you, we would typically see those registered in the name of the startup. However, uh, there are some things that can happen in the academic setting that can really limit the ability to pursue trademarks. So we, we often advise clients, uh, you know, come to us and they might be using a coin term uh, in an academic paper and that can, or a uh, patent application, and that can really limit uh, the ability to try to register that trademark at a later point. Uh, the key thing to remember with regards to trademarks is that trademarks are adjectives. Uh, and if you're using them as nouns, think of Kleenex, cellophane, uh, Xerox, that can result in, in what's called genericide. So uh, although if you're in the academic setting, you may not be able to necessarily create a trademark, you can certainly make things worse for you. Uh, and, and, you know, it's always good to be careful in how you're using the mark. So that's my presentation. Uh, certainly happy to answer questions that anyone has. Working? Oh, good. Um, so if you just give me a minute, yeah. we'll see who the folks are with questions. But let me just, uh, uh, as a point of privilege, ask a question about um, trademarks. Uh, I'm sorry, co copyrights. So. Many years ago, I, I generated a product, and somebody said to me, you really should copyright this. And I said, well, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. It, it, se it seems unlikely that it would matter. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you know, one thing you could do is just mail it to yourself so you at least have the postmark date as a way of establishing when you do get around to putting up a copyright that you actually have the idea first. Is there any value in that concept? Uh, th th we get that question a lot, uh, and there is some value in at least having, it, it, it provides evidence that you had it as of a, a particular date. Uh, it's, it's probably less of an issue nowadays because, you know, with email we have dates, so if you emailed it to somebody, you have evidence. Uh, you know, we typically, in, in the copyright sense, we, we don't really see a whole lot of battles over who invented it. Instead, it really often is an issue of how similar one work is to another. Thanks. Any, You're anybody else? Questions? Yeah, Adam, hang on a second. Sure. So, uh, Brian, could you just go back to the trademark a little bit? Um, yeah. And I guess 
uh, expand on the downside of, of doing it within the academic setting? Yeah. So, so uh, trademarks uh, are really a, a way of protecting goodwill and showing quality. So if we go down the street and you see sneakers with a swoosh on it, the idea is that I recognize that the swoosh is a trademark. It's affiliated with Nike. Nike makes quality shoes. So therefore, I, don't, you know, I may want to buy these because they're uh, you know, particularly sought after. Or at a minimum, I at least recognize th these are relatively good sneakers that may be worth a higher cost. Uh, so that works fine so long as Nike is the person who's overseeing the production. Or if it's in you know, the name of a it, you know, uh, for example, I mean, if you're buying a T-shirt that says Beyonce, you know, you assume that Beyonce uh, is licensing that and is at least holding her vendors to a certain amount of quality. Uh, that gets a little bit more problematic in a uni if the university is owning the trademark and the university is not providing the service. Uh, you know, to, again, to use TJU as an example, if TJU could register for a trademark for providing educational services, that's an easy one. They're providing it, and, that, and that's your business. Uh, but to the extent that a university was going to own a trademark for a medical device, now you're getting outside of the university's core competency. The university's not going to be producing the product. And uh, in, in order to avoid something called naked licensing, which limits, which can actually extinguish trademark rights, the owner needs to provide that quality control. So most universities don't want to be in a position where they have to be overseeing their licensee, not just from a, are you, infring are you using our patents, but are you producing a product that we are comfortable having some legal liability for? Uh, you know, that, that becomes very problematic. Hang on one second. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm new to new to design rights this yeah. is really interesting I'm, sh I'm wondering what the language is like what's the verb you could say like I trademarked this product or there's copyright this is copyrighted what do you how do you refer to design rights how do you yeah that's a good question mean, we typically would say that we uh, uh, you know that one of our clients owns a design patent on this uh, you know the, and the, la and the verbiage actually varies from country to country in Europe, it's a uh, community registered design or registered community design. Um, I'm trying to think what what it's called in, in Canada, uh, but you know, d design rights is usually uh, the more the more generic term. Anybody else? Any other questions, Dr. Astami? He's eating lunch. <laughs> Adam, just a moment. So, so, just, so one, I'm appreciative of, of talking about this topic. It's something that isn't discussed a lot. So if one designed a hoodie with unique sense, you know, fabric that sensed, sensed something and had a somewhat unique design, so there are like multiple things built into that potential product, right? Mm -hmm. There's the design of the hoodie. There's the utility patent of how these design how these unique fiber, right? So can yep. you kind of deconstruct from an intellectual property standpoint, what would be all the things, you know, if it interacted with your phone? Could, just for me in the audience. Yeah, sure. You know, how would you kind of unpack that into a potential client? Yeah, so, so uh, when a client comes to us with a new product, what we try to do uh, you know, is really look at it from a variety of different angles. And uh, you, a, a good attorney should be asking you, you know, one, wh what do you think is unique? Then also pressing on different areas that we may, we may see. So you know, we, we often ask a lot of questions with our, uh, with our inventors of, is this something that you're creating or are you buying the fabric, for example? Uh, and it may be that that's a dead end. If you're buying the fabric, then maybe there's you know, utility uh, patents aren't uh, something we can use to protect that. But uh, if the design, if the, the ornamental design of the sweatshirt is unique, well, that's one angle we can take. Uh, and similarly, you know, if, if there's some sort of hardware in there, you're trying to figure out, you know, is, is that something that's patentable? Uh, is, there un is there code uh, that we can register fairly cheaply? Are there trade secrets in terms of how you manufacture this that wouldn't be 
uh, wouldn't be, sorry, discernible to somebody who is looking at the product. Uh, you know, it depends on the product, but I mean, really, what we try to do is look at it from all different angles. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Do, Adam, do you have a follow up to that? Or? So, I think I know the hoodie you're talking about. <laughs> On the East Falls campus, they have these sophisticated machines that can do all sorts of different weaves, right? There's almost an unlimited number of geometric patterns and weaves. So um, how, how do you, um, and let's say that there's, that weave was associated with functionality. Mm -hmm. So is that something you would talk about with an inventor? And when, then, when there are an unlimited number of designs geometric designs, fractals, how do, you, um, how, how do you try to protect that concept? Yeah, so, so, so what we do try to do, especially on, on the design patents, it, is you know, we go through a lot of different iterations. Uh, and, and just going back to some of these, you know, we really do uh, spend a, a fair amount of time with our inventors and in trying to think about what's important uh, for driving value for the product and what infringers are likely to try to copy. So uh, you know, with regard to this therapy device here, you can see there's a fair amount of uh, dotted lines, what we call phantom lines. So for example, there's really not much value in claiming the cords that are going in and out of this device. Similarly, here, you know, what they focus on really is this uh, kind of quadru rounded quadrilateral and then the orientation of those four lights. Uh, similarly, if we go back a little bit further, here's another example. Uh, obviously, they're claiming the stop sign, not the bus itself. Uh, but then, you know, if you get into Apple, for example, you know, here, this is the only thing they're claiming, the battery. They've grayed out the rest of it. And it, it really, there really is a lot of strategy and art in terms of how you try to figure out exactly what, that, what, what you're going to claim and what you're not going to claim. Uh, you know, with regard to a particular weave, it, you'd have, as you said, you, you'd have considerations of, you know, is this something that's functional, in which case it's really the proper province of utility patents, or is this something that's really ornamental and it could be, you know, it doesn't provide any functional benefit. And then it's a question of you know, what part of that, or the, do you want to claim the whole thing from a design perspective? Hang on one second. Hi. When uh, news organizations lift photos from social media platforms for a news story and run them on their broadcast networks or in print, is that a violation? I know if you're in the online community, stay there. There's no problem. Right, because of those long terms of uh, usage. S sorry, uh, c uh, just read the question. I just want to make sure I understand it. Uh, a lot of times, news organizations, when a big story breaks, yep. will go into people's personal social media uh, okay. account accounts like Facebook and Twitter. Yep. And I know you can use them online, but if they take them outside into a network broadcast or into print, is that a violation? So it depends on, on the license and, and what the terms are. Uh, there, there is, from a global perspective, I, I think there's a, a, a lot of misunderstanding in terms of what seeing something online means with regards to its copyright status. And, and we have many conversations with our clients about just because you see it online doesn't mean that you can do anything other than just view it. Uh, for example, uh, you know, I, I didn't pull anything uh, you know, beyond the design uh, patents into this presentation. Um, you know, but from, if I'm browsing online, it doesn't really matter whether I'm looking at the Boston Globe or whether I'm looking at somebody's Instagram feed. Uh, both of those are copyrighted, and unless that user is granting, uh, granting rights to us, it, it would be an infringing use. Now, it's not something that you know, you're likely to get served with a lawsuit this afternoon over, uh, but certainly if you're a network, you, you probably have more exposure than you know, if you're putting in a presentation. Is so that? Sure. But from what I understood, if you keep it within the Facebook community, everyone can view it. But if you 
take it outside and make it in print, print edition, or broadcast it on mm -hmm. another news feed, would that be a violation? Well, Full confession, I have not read the Facebook terms of service. Uh, but but it, I mean, it, it's certainly, you know, there certainly would be some copyright risk, uh, most likely. So, so for example, if we're drafting a patent application, uh, and I do a lot of work in the medical device space, and we need, I need a drawing of some, ana some anatomical feature. Uh, you know, what I'll do is I'll go to Wikipedia, or Google has a uh, great image search. You can, within Google Images, you can select uh, under the Creative Commons regime, say, you know, show me works that I can use commercially and that I can modify. And I'll actually restrict my results to those and then make sure I, get, uh, make sure I have proper attribution. So, okay. You mean in terms of would you have access to statutory damages for the second? Yeah. Yeah. Brian, if we could I'd just like to return to a minute to the drawings. You've, wa you've gone through a number yeah, of sure. drawings in your, in your presentation. So suppose a client comes to you, a potential client comes to you. They've got a concept, but they're not really terrific in the art department. Mm -hmm. So what they've got is a very roughed out sketch and then you have talent within your organization that can modify and, and add the levels of necessary sophistication and detail that were demonstrated here today. Yep. So how do you ensure that the person that's doing the drawing is not gonna lift that idea and go someplace else with it? Uh, fair question. Um, so the, the people that we work with actually are outside the organization, but uh, it, it, it long-standing drafts drafts uh, persons and I suppose there's always the risk there I mean obviously you know, there'd be copyright and uh, other issues and you know much like with working with venture capitalists in which you may not have a non-disclosure agreement it, it, you know our, we always take comfort in working with VC that you know if they were to ever try doing that they would never really be able to do business with anyone else again and we have a you know, kind of similar level of comfort with our drafts person so you don't, so, but you, to, just to clarify, so yeah. you don't ask the draft people, drafts people to sign a non-disclosure, you just, you have a working relationship yeah. and they value that working relationship enough that they're not going off the farm. Exactly. Okay, got yeah. it. Thank you. Thank, anybody? Oh, here we go. Hi, um, my question is regarding uh, timing uh, to file. Yeah. Um, recognizing that the U.S. gives you a year, maybe after market, um, when do, you, when do you suggest makes the most sense for a design patent, maybe for one of those up on the screen, um, closer to idea conception or closer to um, release on the market? Or when does it make the most sense? Yes. Yeah, so, so generally, we file right before commercial launch. Uh, and the reason for that is, unlike with a utility patent where you're, you're protecting the concept and you tend to have a lot more flexibility in terms of how you claim it, uh, and because utilities have a, utility patents have a broader scope and then potentially broader exposure to prior art, design patents have a much more focused scope and much more limited ability to amend claims. So what you really want to, you'd hate to file a design patent and then, you know, when you're going through the tooling process or something related to design, you decide, oh, we need to change this edge. You know, at that point, your original design patent is, certainly of diminished value, it may not be worthless, but uh, you know, it's, it's not, you really want to have everything's ironed out. I mean, for example, uh, so the, the, the Apple uh, 305 on the left, that, was, that came out of a design application that was filed either the day Steve Jobs uh, unveiled the iPhone or the day before. Um, I think Apple filed like 200, it, it had 200, uh, figure, 200 figures in it. Uh, Apple's still prosecuting it today. Uh, so, you know, I mean, even with, you know, a very professional organization like Apple, these things, you know, tend to go down to the wire. And it's not just because they're rushing the work, it's because the product is probably still changing up until launch. Anyone else? Yes. 
Um, so, um, let's say, let's talk about the cryo vials, for example. Yeah, sure. I make a machine and I, I think that the cryo vials would work in that machine perfectly or it's a little tube rack or whatever. If I wanted to use this exact design, do I then pay royalties to the person who owns the copyright or the trademark? Or can I not use it at all? Or asking it the other way around, if I were to design perfect cryo vials, but I have no way of producing them, what do I do with this patent? How do I use it to yes. make money? Sure. So, so from the, the university perspective, whether it's a design or a utility patent, uh, universities such as TJU uh, and really many universities throughout the country have a, a licensing program. Uh, where the university owns it, uh, collects royalties, and oftentimes the university, like TJU for example, uh, will work with, uh, oftentimes it's university faculty or staff uh, that want to develop a company around this, and, and they'll license that to that startup, and you know, a lot of them fail, uh, but a lot of them are uh, very successful. So if I could just add a little bit to that, speaking from the innovation side of the equation. So Brian just referenced the, that the universities do that kind of thing. It, within the innovation pillar, we have people that work with Brian as counsel um, that uh, evaluate ideas and then make recommendations to you. Is this a good opportunity for a licensing agreement? Do you really want to be in the business? Is this big enough to be a company? Or should it be something else? And if it's something else, then what something else is that? And where's the right place to go? So within the innovation pillar, we have that talent. And they're, and they're able to make those recommendations. And then once they figure that out, then they call this guy. Does that, does that help? OK. Anyone else? I think we're, I think we're ready to call it. All I think right. it's a wrap. Great. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you all Brian. Very much. Thanks very much.